You may be seated. I'm really excited about this series, I'm getting started into thriving in Babylon and just studying through some of the book of Daniel and seeing what we've got going on with uh, these four young men. Last week we talked about gener- uh, generations, and, and as we continue talking about this, we see that there's Daniel and these young men, they're, they're teenagers, they're young adults. And they're moving forward in life, and, and they've had some generations pour into them and teach them and, and encourage them. And they're moving on in life, and they're, they're learning what it looks like to live life. And as we look at this, we see in the year of 587 B.C., there was a city called Jerusalem. And this, this city, it, it came under attack from, from this Be- Babylonian empire. And as they were attacking, there was this fight taking place. There was this army. There was this battle. It was a, a big, bloody scene. And about a year later, what took place is we saw the city, the city walls fall, we saw the temple burn to the ground, and Babylon, Babylon has defeated, has destroyed, and has taken about a thousand or more Israelites into captivity. They've taken these Israelites, they've moved them from their homes, they relocated them into this Babylonian nation, and they became exiles, they were without a home. As they were trying to figure out life, as they were moving through life and, and seeing what to take place, they, I'm, I'm sure some of them thought to themselves, uh, maybe what we have is only two choices. Maybe what we need to do is we need to pick up our pitchforks and we need to go and we need to fight and we need to, to battle and we need to continue on ke- keeping on. Like they were, they were angry, they were upset and they were ready to fight. I look around this room and I know who's watching online and there are some of you that do this, Right? And that's okay. Like, I'm excited that you're in this building and watching online because when you're here with me, I know that I'm safe. Like, there is no issue in my mind that if somebody comes in this door and wants to attack me, you're going to get between me and that person and you're going to hold up your pitchfork and you're going to fight and I'm going to be like, woohoo, this is good. I think probably there's some other Israelites who are like, ah, I'm just going to compromise a little bit. I'm just going to grab my pillow, I'm going to put on the the robes and the the clothing that they tell me to put on, I'm going to to eat the foods that they tell me to eat, I'm just going to lay down on my pillow and I'm just going to do what I'm told. There's probably some of you in the room that are like that. There's probably some of you watching online who would just be rather not have any issues with life and you would just do whatever is told of you and you would just move on, you would compromise and that would be okay. As we're looking at the Israelites and we're looking at them in this exile, this Babylonian influence that they're finding themselves in, there was a guy by the name of the prophet Jeremiah. And and Jeremiah, what he does is he writes this letter to the Israelites. He's saying, I know who you are. I know what's happening. I I know the battles that you're facing. I know that you're hurting and you're in pain. I, I know there's some of you that want to fight and I know there's some of you that want to lay down. But let me give you a third option. Let me just show you a third option Here's what I would like you to do as an elder, as a prophet, as, as someone who is listening to God and revealing his message to you. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to, uh, to build your home. I'm going to ask you to build your home in this Babylonian nation. And I'm going to ask you to build it and make it look good. I'm going to ask you to, to not compromise to put your home in there and to plant some roots in there and to grow up your family inside of there. And as you're teaching your family, as generation after generation teaches your family about the scriptures, about who God is, Yahweh, and what's taking place, I want you to grow your family. I want you to build your home. I want you to succeed, and I want you to succeed well. I want you, as prophet Jeremiah talks about, he says, I want you to be good stewards to be good citizens and to obey and to do what you've been asked to do. I want you to talk to your neighbors. I want you to to look around and and be influenced and to influence the neighbors. I want you to see what's taking place in your community that you're finding yourself in. And I want you to pray for your leaders. I want you to love them. This one's hard for me. Why would would the prophet Jeremiah say, I want you to pray for for the leaders. I I want you to pray for those that have just taken over your land. I want you to pray for those that are are beating you and destroying you and these evil people. I want you to go and I want you to pray for them. That's tough words to hear from Jeremiah. Actually, let's read this. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. Jeremiah says this, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. 
and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Ooh, I don't like hearing that, right? I, I, I don't want to hear those words. And the, Jeremiah continues, for it is in its welfare, you will find your welfare. You see what Jeremiah is telling him? He's telling him something crazy. It, it surprises all of us. He says, don't, tell, don't compromise. Don't follow into the, the ways of the land. Don't, don't do the, the sinful habits that the Babylonians are doing. Actually, take a stand against that. Don't fall into the temptations that you're seeing. D don't, don't be concerned with what they're doing. But thrive. Build a family. Plant roots. You're going to be here for a very, very long time. And Jeremiah is saying, be concerned with what the Lord is concerned about. Be concerned with the welfare of the city. Why is Jeremiah telling the Israelites this? I had to look through that because, like I said, I struggle with this. I, I don't want to pray for my leaders, honestly. <laughs> it's hard for me. So what was Jeremiah telling the Israelites as they were finding themselves in this exile, being in this Babylonian culture of, of sinful, this sinful nation, this evil nation? Why would Jeremiah tell them this? And it's simply right here. So God's population would grow. Because when my home and my family are involved in the culture that I'm involved in, when, when my home and my family and I'm going into my neighborhoods and I'm loving and I'm praying for the spiritual leaders and for those leaders who are against me, we're going to see God's kingdom grow. Ooh. So this brings us into the story of this young man by the name of Daniel. He too was taken into this captivity. He was in exile. He and a few of his friends, they, they were taken from their homes. They were taken from their fathers, their grandfathers. They were taken out of the generations that they were being taught from. And they were recruited to work inside of this high court of Babylon. And as I was reading through this and I was studying this this week, I, I realized that this was one of my favorite books as a Sunday school kid, right? Daniel and the Lion's Den, that's exciting. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the furnace and then, then there was Jesus with them. Like, that's awesome. Right? God's power is saving them. We're seeing the dreams. We're seeing the visions. Like, this was a fun book for me to study as a kid in Sunday school because all of the, the words that were said and the excitement that was said, veggie tales, huh? Veggie tales, so good. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. During the third year of the king of Jehoiakim, reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. He destroyed it. And look what verse 2 says. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar, evil, took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Veggie tales never taught me that the Lord gave them Jerusalem. My Sunday school never taught me that, that the Lord gave those holy items to evil King Nebuchadnezzar. I was never taught that the Lord gave destruction to the temple. Why would God do this? Why did this take place? And I think for us to understand as Daniel writes through these chapters in his book, we have to understand that he's responding to the Lord gave. Like that was the cornerstone of Daniel's faith. The Lord gave. Why am I being put into this situation? Why as a young man am I taken, been, been taken out of my land? Why as a young man am I having to write this story? Why am I having to respond the way I'm responding? Why do I have to do what God's telling me to do? And he realizes, verse 2, the Lord gave. And as Daniel understands that, and, and as Daniel puts his faith into that, he knows that God is, control, is in control of those who are in control. King Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in control. But God is in control of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so for us to understand the rest of this book, we have to understand that Daniel's firm foundation was in Yahweh God. And the Lord gave 
And through this time of persecution, through this time of hurts and pains, through this time of evil Babylonian culture and and religious struggles that they're facing, God was not surprised by any of it, just like God's not surprised today. And God was not caught off guard by any of the holy items being taken out of the temple and abused and punished and kicked. God was not con- God was not surprised at who was in control in this moment because the Lord gave. And we're finding ourselves today in the American culture in this same position. Let me just encourage you the Lord gave and God is in control of those who we think are in control. Daniel chapter 1 verse 3 then the king ordered Ashmenaz his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who have been brought to Babylon as captive. Verse 4, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and are gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal place. Train these young men in the language and the literature of Babylon. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine for his own, from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and they would enter into the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen from the tribe of Judah. Verse 7, the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Beltazazar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. Azariah was called Abednego. You see, these these men, these young men who have been trained up in in Yahweh, the the only God, the one true God, they were trained up in the scriptures. They understood the Torah. They understood the, the commandments that they were given. Their fathers and their grandfathers, they showed them the way. And here all of a sudden they're finding themselves in this Babylonian culture. And they're finding themselves with these new names, which is a sign of rulers being and having authority over them. The Babylonian king, the Nebuchadnezzar, was changing their names. Why? Because he was showing, I have the power. I'm in charge. I'm in control here. And so he changed their names. These four men, they found themselves in this new culture, and it was based on evil desires. They understood who Yahweh was and God was. They understood the culture of having a faith base. They understood the culture of following the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law. They understood what they were supposed to do with their spiritual side. And now they're finding themselves in this place where they didn't want to be. They found them play, themselves in this place where there's idols and golden statues and, and certain foods and certain clothing that they weren't supposed to wear. They were finding themselves in a religious identity, and it was a crisis moment for them. What do we do? Do we pick up our pitchforks, or do we just simply lay down? Where are we? They find themselves dependent and working for this royal court, evil King Nebuchadnezzar. This sounds like a compromise to me. Name changed. Being put into a, a royal court. It sounds like maybe they just picked up their pillow and they were like, okay, we'll just follow along. We'll do it. Or maybe, maybe your mind went exactly, exactly where my mind went was, okay, they're going to get inside of this court. They're going to get inside of the kingdom. They're going to pick up, pick up their pitchforks and they're going to stab the king in the back as soon as they're comfortable inside. But Jeremiah, the prophet, said, no, no. No, no. Listen, you've heard the teachings of your generations before. You've heard what I've said as a prophet. You've heard from God. Build your home, build your family. Say hello and pray for those that are in charge. And then we see how Daniel responds in verse 8. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. You understand where he's at. In this moment, the food is being brought in, the clothing is being brought in. They're asking Daniel to change his religious identity. Fall asleep, Daniel, it's okay. And Daniel responds how Jeremiah and his elders asked him to respond. I will not bow to this king. I will not change my religious identity. I will not. I'll stand. I'll stand firm in that. And so he asked, can I do something else? Can you test my God? 
Will you allow my God to show you who he is? And so he's finding himself in this moment of temptation, but he's protecting himself because of his faith that he had. He finds himself in this foreign land where he's not at home, where he's, he's been taken away. And he's being, becoming even more dependent on his safety and on his life to God, Yahweh. He's ready to fight. But from the generations before him, he was told, no, have faith in God. Stand up, be firm. You know your religious identity is in God, Yahweh. But find faith in God. Find strength in God. And find protection in God. The Apostle Peter, he actually put it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He said, Dear friends, I warn you as a temporary residence and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Daniel had a moment. Do I fight? Do I lay down? No, no, no. I'm going to stand firm in God. This world isn't my home anyways. I'm just a foreigner here. This is my temporary residence. I'm going to do the best I can to honor God and to pray for my spiritual leaders and to pray for the leaders that are in control of me. But I will not disobey God. And as we read through this, and as I think about the temporary residents and the foreigners of this land, I, I, I have to go back to Adam and Eve. Right? The very first book of the Bible, when God created everything, including humans, we have to go back to this moment where these humans, they disobeyed God, and because of that, they were kicked out of this, bar, this garden, this perfect place. And they were sent into exile. And from that very moment on, all of us, including me and you and everybody watching online, all of us have been living in exile, separated from God. We, we've been living in this evil nation, this evil desire. We've been separated from God. And as we continue to read through the, the scriptures, we see this separation as exile. And we've been living there ever since Adam and Eve. And as we read through the New Testament scriptures, as we get into the New Testament scriptures where Jesus Christ came, we see that this evil Babylon experience or this culture, or this, this nation that we read about in the Old Testament, this becomes more of an imagery into the New Testament. Maybe it's even just a reminder of what the Israelites went through. Because each of us, because of the sin from Adam and Eve and through all generations, up to this moment today and even into the future, each of us live in a Babylonian culture. Exile. Because of our sin. There's evil. There's separation from God. And in this evil, every single day, especially in this American culture we're finding ourselves in, we're being daily influenced by evil. We're, this American culture is, is trying to get rid of absolute truth, right? We're saying there's no God-given gender, it's just whoever or whatever. We're seeing that marriages are de being destroyed and there's no longer this lifelong covenant between husband and wife. We're seeing sex being driven into so much. It's even being forced on our children now today. In this American culture we're finding ourselves, where this evil culture we're finding ourselves in, we're saying it's okay to murder babies. This American culture we're finding ourselves is living in sin. And we're in exile because we're separated from God and we're living in this Babylonian culture of evil. And we're trying to find ourselves as Christ followers, as, as someone who has accepted Jesus Christ, what do I do? How do I live in this very own Babylon that I'm fighting myself in? What do I do? Do I pick up my pitchfork? Do I pick up my pillow? Daniel obeyed God in these moments. Daniel remained faithful to the teaching of his elders and to faithful to the teachings of the scriptures. He prayed and he remained true to God in obedience. He didn't allow the evil culture to change him. He didn't allow the temptations to move him. He remained in obedience to Yahweh God. He served and he served well. And he prayed for those that are in control because he understood that God put them there. And just let me remind you what the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 29, 7. He said, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. My friends, Christ followers, journey ministries, 
Seek the welfare of the city we're in. Build your home. Build your family. Plant roots in. Say hello to your neighbors and love the people around you. And pray for those that are in control. And pray that God will have his way. And people will understand who he is as their personal savior. As Daniel and their friends, they lived in this exile. This new story started. There, there were some rumors of this new king that was going to be coming. This hope that was going to be coming. And many generations after Daniel had already passed away, we, we meet this new man by the name of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 14, we see this, and the word, that's Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, what Jesus did, he was fully God, but he became fully man. He was in exile, separated from his authority in heaven, and came to earth, his creation. He was living in exile so that he could have a relationship with you and with me. And through this moment of exile where he left his kingdom, heaven, he was on earth and he continued to speak about this new home that was going to be offered to us. He continued to speak about this new kingdom that was coming. And then he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through me in John chapter 14, verse 6. And as people continued to listen to Jesus' message, as he went to the homeless, as he went to the hurting, as he went to the poor, as he went to the sick, he didn't lay down, but he also didn't pick up his pitchfork. He didn't lay down, he stood firm in the authority of God. But he also served, and he loved, and he cared for, and he prayed. And in these moments, as he's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, he is intentionally living in a culture and he's intentionally remaining faithful to God. So what does that leave us, Christ followers? Are we living on mission? Are we taking Jesus' example? Are we taking the, the examples from the generations past? Are we taking the example of Jeremiah? And are we intentionally living in culture, separated, but there? Are we planting our home? Are we planting our family? Are we talking to our neighbors? And we are we praying for the people around us? And if we are, it's kind of like this picture. We're going to see people living in exile, but belonging to a family. And when this family belongs, when we're intentional in this culture, when we remain faithful to God, when we set up our homes and plant our gardens and grow our families, when we are passing on godly wisdom to the generations around us, when we're determined to resist evil and to flee the temptations and those influences, when we are committed to pray for our neighbors and our leaders, we're going to thrive in Babylon. The truth is going to spread, and the good news of Jesus is going to go out into all of the world. Paul actually answers this when he talks about Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14. He says, for the world is not our permanent home. If you are a Christ follower, you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This world is not your home because we are looking forward to a home yet to come. Heaven. Eternity with God. And Christ followers, we can commit ourselves to Jesus. And as we do, we journey forward to this permanent home that Paul is talking about. And we stand firm in the grace and the truth that Jesus has taught and we do not bow to evil, and we do refuse to disobey God, and we stand firm when everybody else around us is picking up their pillow and sleeping. And as Christ followers, we make an impact on the world through our obedience in God the Father and his teachings that we've learned. Why? Because he is in control. Wow. Let's pray. God, you are good. God, we've seen and heard your teachings. Jesus, we've seen and heard the way you have interacted with others. I struggle. My sinful nature wants to take over and I want to fight. And sometimes that's appropriate. Sometimes we have to stand in obedience to you. We also have to realize, like Daniel did, 
that you are in control. That does not give us permission to lay down on our pillow and sleep. What that does, Father, is give us hope. Because you are in control. You have given. Your ways are higher than mine and your thoughts are better than ours. And sometimes, Father, we want things done the way we want things done. And you simply say no. Sometimes you say yes. And other times you say wait. For the Israelites who disobeyed you and found themselves in this exile, this Babylonian nation, you were telling them to wait. For us as Christ followers today, standing up against evil authorities, you're telling us to wait. Because this world is not our home. And so we stand in obedience building our homes and our families into the faith-based truth that you have given us. We build our homes and our families on the scriptures and we hide them in our hearts so that we won't sin against you. And then we go out into all of the world and we say hello to our neighbors and we pray for those that are in authority. in obedience for what you've asked us to do. Why? So that the world will know you better. Wow. Help us to thrive in this American Babylon we're finding ourselves in. Help us to love you with everything that we have and to love our neighbor but to stand firm in the truth. Be glorified through our actions, Father. Holy Spirit, continue to speak. What a privilege it is to have conversations with you. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Will you stand with us and sing, please? John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it was not so, I would not have told you to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. That's the moment when we find ourselves no longer in exile. But until then, we're living in this American Babylonian culture, and we're called faithfully serve God and to love others. Will you do that with me? After church today, we're going to clean up the room. We have to clean up all summer long. I know, what a bummer, right? We're going to clean up the church building. We're going to clean up the school. Get ready to go. And then if you want, meet me at Abernathy Park. Grab some food. Grab some drinks. I'll grab a couple pizzas to share. We'll just meet in Abernathy Park if you want to, and we'll hang out there for a while just so I can get to know you a little bit better. Go and live life well. See you later. Bye-bye.